we are in a limestone cave, right at the edge of a 70-foot drop. Caver Steve Millet rigs the rope. He does so without conversation, methodically. A series of two 11mm ropes are clipped into rock bolts in the cave wall. Now we will descend. We reach the bottom and get out of the underground monsoon and into a narrow cave passage. We soon reach another short drop. Then another. Finally, we make it to the main stream bed where water-carved passages snake for miles underground. This is McPhail's Cave, a limestone cave in Schoharie County, New York, a region famous for its limestone geology and home to world-class tour caves like Howe Caverns. The cave's exploration dates all the way back to the 1850s, a time when very few caves were being explored in the U.S. A local professor named T.A. McPhail began studying the geology of the cave. On a warm July day in 1854, McPhail was ascending out of the pit upstream from where we are now, when he fell from the rope and landed on the bottom of the cave. A member of his party quickly descended and found McPhail barely conscious. He died shortly after. The cave was henceforth known as McPhail's Cave. Shortly after his death, the entrance was blocked with logs and soon forgotten. Deeper in the cave, we see firsthand how it was formed. Water flows underground and dissolves the rock. The result is spectacular. Narrow tunnels with jagged walls twist and turn through the rock. Every corner creates a feeling of suspense at what we may behold. It's a limestone cave. It, it starts in the Quaymans limestone, goes down into the Manlius, and each of those layers is about 50 feet. And we're walking at the bottom of the Manlius limestone now, and we eventually get into the Rondout, which is a, the next lever down, which doesn't usually form big cave, but it becomes the floor of this cave. And we're maybe a little less than half a mile in, into the cave. Serious exploration of the cave began as late as the 1960s. When a series of expeditions led by cavers Fred Stone, Tom Engel, Art Palmer, and Chuck Porter sought to push the limits of the cave. These intensive explorations involved as much as 22 hours underground. With gear that can only be described as crude in today's world of wetsuits and LED lights. Only through these painstaking expeditions was McPhail's cave determined to be the longest in the Northeast U.S.
This is the longest cave in the Northeast by far. It's about eight miles long. They're the kind of number two is around four miles. Number three is around three miles, and then maybe it's to two miles or so. So it's quite a bit bigger and longer than any of the caves up here. And it's, I mean, the most typical caves here are one mile, or many of them are, you know, 500 feet or 100 feet or 50 feet. We still call them caves and we still go in them, but it's very different. And it's a deep cave. It's, in this area, it's probably 52 degrees year round. Down near the, the bottom of the cave, it's in the mid to low 40s. We measured a couple weeks ago. So it's chilly. And the, the bottom of the cave is about just around 300 feet deep from the top surface. And you, re you rappel down you know, 70 feet, maybe 100 feet of that total in rope. And the rest is just slowly walking down at this slanted angle. And I'd say it, it's nice done. Though going into the cave, you don't really feel like you're going down so much, but coming back up when you're fighting the water every step, you, you do feel the, the angle. It's very easy to go down the waterfall and come back up, but after spending hours down here and you know, soaking wet, 100% humidity and 50 degree air, your, your body starts to slow down and your muscles don't work the same way as when you came in. So we'll all feel it on the way up. It's going to be a lot harder to climb. Including Professor McPhail's, there's they've been one or two other deaths in this case, mostly at the entrance from hypothermia. And I think both happened when it was middle of the winter and people were going into the cave when it's below freezing outside and getting frozen at the entrance. So it is a, a dangerous place and that's why it's typically nowadays it's closed in the winter because it's dangerous but also because there's a lot of bats that hibernate in this cave. So and also water levels pick up in the winter so it's not a nice place to be. As, as you could see when we were walking through there's lots of sticks up in the ceiling you know 10 feet up in the air. That's because the water gets that high. And I don't think that it's necessarily flowing at that height. I think it gets to the bottom and then back floods up. But this whole eight miles of cave is pretty much underwater. It is possible to lose all sense of time down here. How many thousands of years have these passageways existed for? How many thousands of years will they continue to exist? There is something fascinating about a place that is so slow changing. These formations are formed by dripping water, leaving behind a residue of calcite over hundreds of years. A cave is a place where the earth is free to create long-term sculptures. These stalactites are often referred to as decorations, as art. infinite combinations of form, color, and texture. I sometimes get the feeling that these decorations were never meant to be seen, as if they were created by some demented artist working in the dark. And now we view these strange creations and attempt to fit them to our notion of art. Seeking the ones that are most beautiful to us, or those that we can relate to the surface world. 
This is the Bacon Formation. Here is the Brain Rock. Our eye takes random formations and invents an aesthetic behind it. They are creations thousands of years in the making, formed one drip at a time. Watch as this stalactite is created. And this work will never be truly complete until one day, the day the water stops dripping. There is something about caves that beckons you deeper and deeper. But knowing we have a long way back out, we decided to turn around. The cave has always held a strong allure to those who explore its depths. So much so that McPhail's was in fact the first cave ever owned by the National Speleological Society, and thus preserving it for the enjoyment of cavers in perpetuity. With our objective complete, we begin our trek back to the entrance. We eventually reach Koiman's Dome and begin our wet ascent out of the cave. It's always long and slow. Because <laughs> it's, it's, we've got a double rig so we can have two people climb in at the same time, but one side is really in the water, one is not so much in the water and a little easier. But it, it always takes a long time and a lot of waiting. So we'll try to branch off into groups of three or so and stagger ourselves because it's waiting at the bottom of the dome in the, the hurricane of wind and water is really not a nice place to spend a lot of time and you get cold very quick. And then it's, your muscles are cold so it's a lot harder to climb. We have those past explorers to thank for this unique experience in this preserved and protected cave. A cave that will go on to inspire the next wave of explorers. Those that will reveal to the rest of us the mysteries that lie deep underground. <laughs>